Hello, global citizens, and welcome to the Lift As We Rise podcast. You're listening to our Future Thrive SME series today. On Future Thrive SMEs, we speak to local businesses to promote buy local in the new normal. We also influence the integration of sustainable development goals in business strategies. So wherever you are in the world today, thank you for joining us. Whether you're joining us live or listening to the recording, you're most welcome. Like or share this video to ensure that our featured SME today gets the visibility that they deserve. It could be your SME that we speak to next. And if you are keen to join the panel, Contact us through our website at www.stratistute.co.za. You can also, of course, subscribe to our Strat Connect YouTube channel and catch all our podcasts and webinars over there. Today, we speak to Dr. Doug Mateus, an experienced executive in marketing, leadership, and organizational performance, an evergreen learner, and also a lecturer. Doug shares my alma mater, the University of Port Elizabeth, which of course is now called the Nelson Mandela University, where he qualified with a BCom in honors in marketing. He went on to complete an MBA at the Wits Business School and progressed to completing a DBA from the University of Phoenix in Arizona. Doug has held executive marketing positions in the telco and entertainment industries and across his companies include big names like Celsi, Stekinico and Nashua. He's a seasoned expert in brand management, commercial sponsorships, and in corporate social investment strategies. More recently, Doug has turned his professional focus to consulting in positive leadership and how abundance, being respectful, decent, and kind can move people and companies forward. He is also a FIFA registered lecturer in the program for sports management, which is offered by the Nelson Mandela University. Doug, it really is a pleasure to be hosting you today on Future Thrive SMEs. You normally the one asking us interesting questions, and this time you're in the hot seat. Great. Thanks, Roshni. It's really a, it's a pleasure for me to be on, on the show with you, and thanks for the invite. So yeah, as you say, the tables turned last year at the end of the year. You were our last guest on, on the Doc and the Guru podcast, and you know I'm glad to, to be able to be on your show today. And Doug, thanks for the cue. So yes, you do feature host the Doc and Guru with your co-host Gordon. Um, I believe that you've reached a milestone. Tell us about that. So we've done we've done 50, uh, 50 odd episodes, and and yesterday I heard that we just got into the top ten of Apple downloads in South Africa for for business podcasts. So that's quite a you know we're quite pleased by that. You know you never quite know how these things go, and uh, we've had some really great guests, yourself included, some fantastic content, and you know hopefully it lands and resonates because we want something you know unlike bubble gum. It's got to have some sustainability. It can't just taste nice for thirty minutes. And so hopefully some of those lessons are permeating. Uh, you know, businesses, not just here, but, but around the world. So we're very pleased with that. Well, Doug, to you, Gordon, and the team, super well done and congratulations. So Thanks. in such a disruptive time for leaders across all spheres of business, sports, and of course, society, I'm really keen to glean in in your leadership and marketing experience today. So let's get straight into it. Sure. So from the chilled shores of Port Elizabeth, to the dynamic industries that you've worked in, in Johannesburg, and now to becoming a global specialist in leadership. It sounds like a journey of success and hard work and a bit of passion, of course. Take us through your story, Doug. Yeah, you know, Rashi, I'm, as you say, you know, I I'm, I'm, was resident of, of, of Port Elizabeth and, and went to the university, uh, was school there and all the rest of it. And, and I started my first job at Firestone in, in PE. And it was, a, you know, looking back, fantastic times um, working. And if you cast your mind back, we're talking 1989 now, you know, very um, unstable workforce, uh, you know, lots of, of, of industrial unrest, anxiety, and also quite interestingly, um, a lot of mix of, of what you see in South Africa today. And you know, for the very first time, we moved people of color above white people in terms of leadership positions. And that in itself caused anxiety. You know, today in 2021, we're talking about the role of women uh, in the workplace. I mean, it's just, it's crazy that you can even be even just debating this, et cetera, et cetera. In those days, I remember one of the formative lessons that I learned back in 1989, 1990 was, uh, was still then called 
uh, stereotype reduction. Today it's diversity training and a lot of work in equity and inclusion in diversity today, today um, around you know, breaking down those silos and understanding that we're all South Africans and we're all working for a common place. Uh, and one of the very first things I realized there um, was the power of sport to break down those barriers because it doesn't see color or gender or race or any of those things. And we introduced, you know, a lot of fun activities, sports-based, be it, you know, the old race against the train, uh, action cricket is just coming in, six-a-side soccer. And it's amazing what those things taught me uh, quite outside of university uh, in terms of breaking down barriers. So when you walked on the factory floor after having played a game, of sport when you're in a team and purposefully mixed teams. So, you know, two guys from production, one guy from HR, guy from sales, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. And, and those lessons I've taken, you know, through, throughout my career in terms of trying to break down barriers uh, and see the common good in people and not just the obvious differences. You know, from there on out, you know, I wanted to get into marketing and sales and I, I moved up to Johannesburg. And, and, you know, subsequently through the years of a 30 year career, worked uh, at some, uh, some really great brands, you know, uh, and, and the last one, I was pleased, you know, with my team, we, uh, we built and ran the fastest growing brand in South Africa in 2018 with a 48% year-on-year growth and a brand valuation of just under a billion dollars. So, and that made it the 16th most valuable brand in the country. So, a fantastic journey. And in between of that, you know, all of that, some unbelievable highlights, worked with some great people. And also, I was privileged in the, in the national stable to have traveled the world, you know. We were very incentivized those days, very uh, sales-driven. And a lot of our incentives were overseas travel. And so, you know, I, I was very lucky to have gone and traveled the world and brought back a lot of those lessons, you know. And a lot of those lessons are, are all around you. And I think one of the earlier lessons I learned from one of the great guys at Nash was sometimes the answer is not in the book, it's in life. You know, you've got to always be aware of the answer. It may be on a sidewalk, it may be uh, in a pub, it may be at church, it may be anywhere. Uh, and so certainly I brought all those lessons together and yeah, you know, um, and, and through the years had a, had a, you know, about to think a fairly successful career. Fantastic, Doug. And that's that's the mark of a successful entrepreneur. It's someone someone who walks through life and picks up the experiences, good and bad, and really leverages those to follow a passion to give back to society in a way that's most impactful. And sounds like you've done that in some ways, and we want to hear more about that. So talk to us about positive leadership. What are the principles that you advocate are key to building high-performance organizations? Roshni, and I, and I think I just want to start off by saying that, you know, we all human, we all make mistakes, and we're not always the best we can be every day. And I think the general theory and principle of not just positive leadership, which is a, a sort of a derivative of positive psychology, uh, is to, to show up and to be your best self you can be every day. Now, again, you know, there are many, many, many times that I failed to do that. Uh, and, and in hindsight, you look back and, and we all do and say, I wish I could have done this differently or that differently. But I think, you know, instead of looking back, I'd like to just use those lessons and say, you know, today I, I want to work with organizations, leaders and teams to move forward. And so some of those principles are, and they're not Again, you know, you don't have to go and read a book or go to Harvard or, or do any of those things to know they should have been taught to most of us as a five-year-old. You know, it's just manners. You know, do unto others as you'd like them to do unto you. You know, that feeling of hurt that you get when somebody embarrasses you publicly or lets you down. And I think that's the, a lot of the principle of that. Now, also, you know, we're not living in an in a, in a unreal world. We're living in the real world. So, as I said, you know, there's stresses and strains on people, and not just COVID. COVID is just one year in, in, in our life, and, and hopefully we can get to the end of it, you know, pretty soon, certainly in, in, in this year and, and earlier rather than later. So, so those lessons are, you know, something like do unto others. That's the golden rule. The, the very famous American poet Maya Angelou wrote many years ago, people will often forget what you said and what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel, good and bad. And unfortunately, in the world we live in, sometimes, you know, we carry the hurt uh, of negative emotions far more than positive. And, and again, I've been the giver of and the receiver of both good and bad uh, leadership, you know? And, and certainly I'm very cognizant and, 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 and um, 
have an understanding of how you make people feel. So that's very important. The other issue is ego. You know, ego often gets in the way of common sense. Sometimes you know the answer, but because there are five people in the room, everyone wants to be right. You know, you want to be the person whose idea is taken forward. And I think that's part of the challenge of, of any type of leader is to try and listen, assimilate, and then, you know, choose a path. But sometimes ego does get in the way of common sense. And again, I've seen it so often through the years where a seemingly good idea is just executed badly, or it's just a bad idea to start with. And that's an age old thing between strategy and execution, because often the person doing the strategy doesn't always execute it. You know, you look at bigger organizations, you know, they, the, the actual strategy gets executed by many people, but yet often poor leaders don't make the effort to engage those people to make sure that they buy into the strategy and the vision. And that's part of positive leadership is making sure that, you know, you've checked your ego and that you allow people the latitude with a clear understanding. Another one of the principles is something I came across years ago, and I think I must give credit to Professor Andy Andrews. Andy at that stage was the, the dean of the Wits Business School. And Andy said to us in, 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 in sort of exco session, he had Andy come in periodically to help us, was around the window and the mirror and when to use which one. And, you know, he explained it to us. He said, so in a good leader, in a positive leader, and I don't think he used the word positive leadership, but just in, a, in, a, in an institute of good leader, when things go well, you look through the proverbial window and you say, well done to my team. But when things go badly, sometimes you've got to pick up the mirror. And it's often the reflection back at you is where the problem starts. The opposite, and I've seen it so many times in bad leadership, uh, that when things go wrong, it's, well, it's you guys, you know, you couldn't execute on what I told you. You know, you can't follow a simple instruction, et cetera, et cetera. So that becomes the language of a negative leader. And of course, when things go well, well, you know, it's, it's always the top guy who did it, the top lady. Which is, which is just crazy if you, if you think about it. So I think those are just at a very high level, you know, some of the principles, uh, of, of positive leadership. And a few years ago, I, well, I did my doctorate and uh, as you mentioned in America, and I met up with a, a, a professor called Professor Kim Cameron, a uh, very famous, uh, academic out of the University of Michigan in uh, just outside of Detroit. And he does a lot of work on positive leadership. And I've stayed and I used Professor Cameron's framework. I stayed in touch with him. He actually ironically lectured at uh, Nelson Mandela University a few years ago. Came and did a, I think, two se series on positive leadership. Um, and in two years ago, I think it was 2019, I went over to America and met up with him, did a two day course with him and brought a lot of those principles back. So yeah, that's the kind of a long way around. Some of the stuff that I'm working with, lecturing, facilitating, uh, and consulting, Roshni, in terms of, you know, just, you can be a nice person and get ahead. You know, uh, you don't have to be a bad person uh, to just get ahead. Yeah, Doug, I'd like to just unpack on a few things you mentioned there in our current context. So, you know, how leaders should be mindful of how they make people feel. It's hell of a difficult when you know as a leader that people are looking to you for the answers and for direction and often relying on you to know what the right answer is. Sometimes as leaders, we don't know. And given the current circumstances and the unprecedented level of uncertainty that we've seen certainly in the last 18 months, um, what were your observations and thoughts around leadership over the COVID crisis? And perhaps lift for us some examples you thought um, were good examples of where leaders actually made their people feel safe and secure. Roshni, I think, you know, absolutely. And I think, you know, leadership often is on a continuum. Now, if you look at, there's, a, there's so many theories and, and models of leadership, as, as you and I both know, one of them is situational leadership, as an example, and I'm not just going to push that, but I'm just saying, which really in simple terms looks at two things. It looks at the complexity of the task and the maturity of the individual. And depending on, on where you sit, you know, so if it's a very simple task with a highly skilled individual, they should be able to do it a lot easier. Certainly last year through something at the world that no one had seen before, it was just it was just chaos and mayhem. And a lot of people are still on that curve somewhere getting out of it. So if I look at you know, companies and leaders that did a lot of good stuff. You know, some people, now if you look at some country leaders of big nations, I think they failed. 
I think they failed their people. I think they failed the world. I think they were unsure. I think they flip-flopped. I think they got bad advice. And I think ego got in the way of a lot of those decisions. Ignorance and ego is a terrible combination. So, and then if I take it to companies that I've seen do really well in South Africa and, and across perhaps the continent, if you look at Lifeway, the soap, you know, they took a category job. They actually at one stage said, hey, wash your hands. They never said use Lifeway. It was obviously a Lifeway ad. So that's going to go down, in my opinion, as a really good case study of people not just making the employees feel well, which is the question you asked me, but making the public feel well. You know, saying to people the very simple thing of, you know, wash your hands given the COVID. The other company, uh, just as an, by way of an example, that in my view has done really well is end to end across the African continent, you know, with wear it for me mask wearing again you know if i look at if i just look at america and i look at some of how divided that country was uh certainly last year uh and mask wearing is just one issue but i mean mtn took a category view now i understand the core business is connectivity but uh they they played a bigger role and sometimes that's the role of i call it the head boy or the head girl when you're a big brand and you're a global brand or you're a leader you've got to elevate yourself out now just to give you some idea of how they did that um i was chatting with the creative head of the agency the other day and and they rolled that out in lockdown uh wear it for me 41 languages 20 countries in all media across the african continent so those are examples of leaders sitting down and taking a view um, one of the other examples is, is around money. You know, a lot of people don't understand fundamentally money. They're not good at managing money. I was, I won't mention the bank, but I was chatting to one of the leaders of one of the major South African banks, and they gave me statistics. You can't understand, well, maybe you do know, you, you're coming out of a finance background, the amount of financial illiteracy in South Africa is scary. I mean, one out of three people in South Africa have fallen prey to a pyramid scheme. Two out of three, 66% of people spend more than they earn in South Africa today. Uh, and so that bank took a category role, a bigger role, and said, let's help you to understand money. Now you'd say, well, shouldn't they have been doing it anyway? You know what I mean? Why only now? The point I'm making is it's never too late to, to help people along the way. So good leaders try to sell their particular product or, or, or service, keep their people going, but also have, I guess, the maturity to say sometimes I don't know, or let's work it out together. And that's my point of situational leadership in terms of maturity. If I just bring it home to, to, to where I was, you know, I've worked with some great leaders who were not scared to say, let's co-create, let's work it out together. Of course, I also worked with other people who knew everything and didn't want an opinion and didn't want to hear. And the, the mantra there was just do as I say. You know, don't give me your opinion. So I think, you know, you can work it out. And certainly I, I firmly believe that the first category is better than the second. Um, the problem, of, I guess, with taking too many views is somewhere along the line, you've also got to draw, you know, draw the line and get it to a point of, um, you know, a point of, of, of landing the plane. But certainly good leaders would listen to their people and then, you know, move along the continuum. Doug, thanks for some fantastic examples there. And, you know, on the question of leadership in uncertain times and uh, the appetite for co-creative strategies, I would like to suggest that it requires a certain level of vulnerability within the leader and also a very high element of trust, which in a country like South Africa, and I'd like to think globally at the moment, one could say, um, there's a deficit in that trust between leaders at the higher level and you know society at large. So most certainly, Doug, I mean, we could, we could have another conversation on vulnerability and the trust gap within leadership. So you are a South African associate to a globally recognized management training company, and that's the Ken Blanchard company. Tell us about that. So what resonates with you around their management principle philosophies and how have companies that you've worked with in South Africa benefited from this methodology? Yeah, thanks, Roshi. I think just let's just touch on before I get on to, on to Ken's work. Um, trust and vulnerability are part of the, part of that skill set, you know, and, and I guess personal attributes of vulnerable leaders. That, but it's and, and you know sometimes and Ken, I mean, 
I'll, I'll chat about him now, but he speaks about that as part of his work as well. The two, in my opinion, two cornerstones in any relationship. One is trust, one is communication. Now, if you don't have those two in the right quantities, you're going to have problems because you're kind of building a house on, on quicksand. Uh, and again, you know, if I look at I look at the times we live in now, perhaps people are more anxious than they've ever been. You know, people have been laid off their sectors. I just look at tourism and travel as a sector that has been decimated. So those people are worried. You know, people are uh, hotel staff. When are they going to go back? Are they going to go back? So the question really then, I guess, for leaders, and I'm not singling out anybody. I'm just merely giving you a, 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 what I would call a common sense approach, is to say, what are they doing today? to build and maintain or increase the trust of people who are sitting at home probably worried. The second part of that is communication, you know, across the board, purposeful communication to get to an end result, not chatting just around a picnic table. That's that's all fun. But we're talking about a business part of conversation, purposeful communication uh, to, to get to an end result. So to answer your question, certainly trust and vulnerability, that comes through, um, and people have got to be big enough as a leader, comfortable enough as a leader, confident enough as a leader to want to go down that route because the old school leadership of the 80s, the hierarchical leadership, command and control was, I'm the boss, I know more, you're a level below, just do as I say and everything will be fine. So, you know, sometimes that, that kind of permeates organizations still to today. And I think the world has moved on, you know, uh, and, and, and there's a different way of working. Just another example by way of a practical example. And I like to, you know, I like to bring these things down to real life and we don't just discuss theories is the whole work from home notion. You know, the average person is not used to it. In a year, you've had to be forced to it. I mean, I, if I look at myself, a number of video calls I made pre last year it was a handful. I mean, I used a platform Skype, which today is, it's just fallen off the cliff. It's all Zoom in teams today, you know, and, and over the year, people have just gravitated towards that. And so how do you manage that anxiety and build up that trust factor and try to lead teams virtually? So onto your question of Ken, I, I first came across the branch of teachings many years ago, uh, again, a very famous to uh, a sort of four quadrant model of situational leadership, uh, Hershey and Blanchard. It's in, I was, I was actually looking earlier, just in preparation for this one of my old textbooks, I couldn't find it, but it's, it literally goes back probably 30 years ago, maybe more, 35 years ago. And it, the principle of the model was how do you lead people? You've got to be task oriented, in other words, you've got to get something done, and you've got to be people oriented. You've got to do it in a humane fashion, in a, in a civilized way, you know, instead of just caning people the whole day and getting, so you, you get people who are very task orientated and have very low people skills and you get other people who want to run a country club and they want to cuddle people, but they actually fail in delivering. So neither one of those two is ideal and the, the optimal one is, is, is the one that you marry both. So um, I then, from a professional point of view, came, uh, went it over and, and I, I did some stuff with Ken 10 years ago in San Diego in America. I worked for a company called National Mobile. Uh, the CEO, Chris Scoble, the head of HR, Teresa, the three of us sat down and said, what do we want to do? And Chris, great guy, great leader, said, listen, let's just do something. I'm not going to get an external strategist in. I'm going to do this just with our exco, which is about maybe six or seven people at the time. And we did a simple exercise. What are we? What are we not? Simple, simple exercise. And we, and we, and we were scared to work out that there were a lot of things that we weren't, far more than we were. So, you know, most people would just lose their nerve and go back to doing things as, as it was. And Chris said, no, what we're going to do is come up with one thing that we're going to do, one thing we're going to do well. And again, and I've heard this term many, many times now, and as recently as, I think it was yesterday, the day before, I was chatting to somebody who used the same term, let the main thing stay the main thing. Um, and what Scopes came up with is we're going to offer service. Now, a lot of companies offer service. And you said, that's not new. I don't want good service. I don't want great service. I want legendary service. In other words, a legend is a story that gets retold. I want us to create a culture of stories that get retold. Chris's view was, why do people have to go and write Harvard case studies? Why can't they write a case study about us? So we set ourselves that goal. And in the process, largely Teresa and I did a lot of research. I found up, uh, came across Ken again, went over to San Diego, met with him. We got both to reason I got trained up and qualified in, in offering legendary service. And that's the first time we ran and I facilitated with her and Chris that for two years, you know, in international mobile uh, 
as as a as a philosophy, Roshni. And I mean, you know, fast forwarding it now, you know, on a few years, a few years ago, I, I became the official distributor for uh, for Ken in, in the region and offer a range of services. And one of the one of the things that you know I spoke about trust. That's a cornerstone course that they teach. Uh, communication, and then some of the courses that I guess were born out of necessity, leading virtually is a, is a classic example. They've reworked their managing change program. Now, a lot of people go through change, and I guess you say, ah, oh, well, my guys will just adapt it, and they probably don't have a purposeful change management program. So that's, again, a cornerstone course that's come through. Legendary service still exists. And then leading yourself, leading others, uh, and then an executive. So there's a, a multitude, it's almost like a pyramid, I guess, of, of different courses, you know, based all the way up to executive stuff. Done these days, both digitally, as, as we do now, as well as face to face. You know, a lot of people are, are still not comfortable coming back to the classroom face to face. And I'm not sure whether that's going to really happen this year. Just talking globally, uh, I was on a, a global seminar with, with Ken's teams around the world. China, completely back face to face. Australia by state, certainly a lot of them. New Zealand completely back face to face. Japan to a degree uh, in that region. America all digital and large parts of Europe now are experiencing, I guess, what we did last year. You know, Denmark for the first time had gone into lockdown. I mean, the, the lady was absolutely devastated. So, so they had to change their delivery mechanism to online. So a lot of the online work is happening now around the world. So just to give you a global context, and yeah, Ken's been around 40 years, one of the top companies uh, in, in Turkey America. And you know, for your viewers and listeners out there, you know, if you want to Google or to check it out, kenblanchard.com, uh, a, a myriad of programs and really good, really great stuff. Doug, listening to you, what strikes me is that you've had a lot of um, experiences in working with US-based consultants, um, looking at US-based management philosophies, for example. Um, and over the last 18 months, I couldn't help but observe and think that the parallels between South Africa and the US are becoming that much more apparent, albeit on a, on a different scale. And I've been wondering whether going forward, there'd be greater opportunities for leadership between South Africa and the US and even other countries to start sharing lessons where South Africa comes from this background of incredible resilience, um, a deep respect for diversity and inclusion, which other countries at the moment are starting to prioritize and vice ver versa. I mean, we want to become a high growth country so we can also learn lessons from the developed countries. Any thoughts on that that you can share with us? No, absolutely. No, that's quite ironic. About uh, probably about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I was doing a, a webinar with an American university out of New York, a fashion institute of technology, very prestigious uh, fashion perfume uh, marketing university. And I had a few guests on, I was hosting the webinar. And one of the ladies asked me that question. And it was around the time when there were those, those the uproar and uprising at the Capitol building in, in Washington. I mean, those ugly scenes and, and, and a few people died. And, and she asked me the exact same question. And what immediately came to mind was about two, three years ago, you may recall, President Trump at that stage said, when asked about Africa, he said, Africa is a shit hole. You can't learn anything from Africa. So, and she asked me the question, I referenced it back and I said to her, because at that stage, President Ramaphosa actually put out something in the press saying, if America wants to, we, we prepare to talk, you know what I mean? So from a constitutional point of view, from a, you know, trying to get it. And we, I mean, as you well know, we are far from perfect as a nation, a long way to go. But, um, you know, certainly we've, we've moved along uh, that continuum of, of, being, of being inclusive. And, and, and it's not just the obvious difference. And I spoke right back to, you know, uh, 1989, 1990, the first thing you saw there was race. Uh, and then gender. Those are the two obvious things you see. But if you scratch, you know, beyond that, you find out that the black woman and the white guy are both Catholics, as an example. You know, then you start getting into sensitive issues like, you know, they may have a special needs kid. By that stage, the tears are flowing in that session. Now, it's not so funny anymore. You know, where it starts off, there's a lot of anxiety and tension in the room. But when you start getting to the human truth of where it's, it's deeper than skin color, religion, uh, a lot of that stuff, and you get to people's kids and, and the commonalities. And I think that's part of 
I'm not expert at diversity and, and inclusion. So please, I'm just giving you my experiences and having worked for 30 years with very different people. Um, sometimes you need, you don't need a band-aid. You need to sometimes have a little bit of surgery to get the thing sorted out, you know, to move forward. And I think as a country, we can learn. I think we can share lessons. And, you know, I was again chatting was this morning to somebody from uh, one of the major banks. I'm not going to mention the bank, it's not relevant. And she was talking, and she's the head of HR for a very big bank. And she was saying, you know, the talent we've got in South Africa. And sometimes we, we, under, we, we, we kind of, I don't know, we, we just don't rate ourselves. You know, she was saying, you know, our people travel across to Europe, to America. They hold their own in Australia. They, they, they can be global citizens. And so absolutely, Russian. I think it's a confidence issue. I think sometimes we, we, we think that, Maybe America and Britain are better. But I, and again, I don't want to get into the politics of it. I think if you look at, at the Trump rule, I think there was a lot to be desired by the effect on the world. I think if you look at Brexit's flip-flopping and you look at the state of COVID in the United Kingdom, there are a lot of things that we've done better, you know, in, in our own way. Uh, and, and you always get critics, you know, you'll get people saying, well, you know, that's, I suppose, the beauty of a democracy is everyone's got a voice. The problem, of course, is sometimes it's an informed voice. But, you know, I guess as a citizen of a country, you know, you want to put your hand up and say, don't close this, do that, more of that, less of this. So, absolutely. I'll, you know, and, and in answering the lady in America, I said to her, I think fundamentally anybody can learn from anyone else, provided you want to, you know, provided your ego doesn't stop you. Now, years ago, I, um, about 10 years ago, I met with a very, very famous uh, psychologist, uh, really uh, one of the biggest writers, one of the most famous people in, in, in organizational psychology and culture, Professor Edgar Schein, taught out of the uh, MIT out of Boston, retired, and I went to his house and met with him and, and had an often tea. And what, um, and what he was talking about was if you put your culture ahead of somebody else. In other words, you think your culture is superior, you're going to have problems and you won't learn. So he was saying, you know, if you can accept that all cultures are equal and you try to meet somebody where they are, it's a bit of a cliched thing, but he said, meet somebody where they are, then you can actually learn from them, provided, you know, you want to, you've got the, the EQ and, and the wherewithal. Yeah, Doug, you know, in the strategy work we do, what becomes apparent in the context of leadership is that unless you know as a business what your purpose is, it's very difficult to align your strategy, your organizational culture, your risk management objectives to getting you to that why. So going back to the South African example, just listening to you, I'm wondering, would we get better cohesion if we go back to the drawing board and just question where it is that we desire to head to and how are we going to get there? Because the, the key part to any strategy is around execution. And when you talk about leadership, it's around bringing people along that journey with you. So how well you articulate that, I guess, um, is how well you're going to achieve that. And Doug, that is really the principle that you link quite well in your work. And that is a connect between purpose and organizational culture. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, right? And it's the age-old story. It's been retold so many times in various shapes or forms. You know, you walk past two bricklayers and you say to them, what are you guys doing? And the one person says, I'm laying bricks. And the other person says, I'm building a cathedral. They're doing exactly the same job, but their vision's very different. Now, that's the whole premise of, of, of the why, you know, the purpose. And, and again, you know, a lot of the times, and, and where I'm cautious is sometimes things become fashionable and people don't always understand why and how and all the rest of it now again yesterday i was on, on our podcast uh, chatting to uh, to a lady who uh, represents a, a market research house they do a lot of work with a lot of brands uh and and they were talking in fact it's canto i won't it's not a secret canto do a lot of work and, and some of the work they do is most liked brands they've been doing it for many years they do brand scores and all the rest of it and we were chatting about um a school shoe brand that was one of the most liked pieces of work last year, but it wasn't. And, and, and so we got talking about the physical object. In other words, marketing is in a school shoe. What is it? It's essentially a piece of protective gear around your foot so that you can put a sock on and, and you can walk to a place. And, and that's kind of a function of the shoe. But then you start talking about the higher purpose 
of a, of a shoe as an example. It's where have you come from and where are you going? So you start looking at different psychological levels and consumer behavior. What does a school shoe say? It says, I'm privileged enough to go to school. I've got a school shoe. Somebody else may not have a school shoe. I go to a place of learning where I can improve myself and be better. So it's a question of looking at marketing. And, and when you talk purpose, it's a question of saying, what is it that you do? Let me give you another example. So quite aside from that, Nando is a very famous brand, as you well know. They essentially serve chicken and a, and a few other things. That's, that's the main product, okay? But what, where they position themselves, and again, in, in doing some work and chatting with them, they're talking about the fact that they've become over time. They've always changed their positioning a little bit. They've always been a bit racy and a bit on edge. But initially, they started out almost as a challenger brand fighting for the sake of fighting, just making a noise, throwing a few punches against much bigger competitors, KFC being the most obvious example uh, in their category. Of late, and I look at the last few years, they've started asking questions that people want to ask. You know, people are starting to ask questions like, you know, uh, of, of the country, and Nando's in their own quirky way of answering, asking it. One of the big things that, now if I make it practical, so it's all fine sitting and we're talking about brand purpose, and they were saying today, the tough economic times, okay, Nando's is not the cheapest categories, uh, 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 you know, sort of chicken provider. What they were doing is they brought down their price point to under 50 rand for a particular meal at that package because of necessity. That's where the, they had to meet the market where the market's gone to. You know what I mean? So that's a question of taking your purpose and living it. But it's no use just saying, listen, we're on the side of the consumer and we're asking tough questions and trying to be a funny brand. When at the end of the day, your consumer saying, we find we, we like it, but there's an affordability issue. Can you make it more affordable? And so that's a practical example. Again, you know, I made the point of being practical, of taking a positioning statement and making it practical. I mentioned earlier about the bank, the, the other bank I was chatting about in terms of, of, of the uh, fiscal literacy, the job, that, and they feel very passionate about, and rightly so. You know, I'll give you another example. I'm just thinking of these as, as we speak now. Capitech, if you've ever drawn money from the ATMs. Now, for many years, this isn't a COVID thing. This is just a positioning of Capitech as a challenger brand up against the four big brands. And, and we've seen the success of Capitech through the years. They've actually got a sticker. I think it's either on the screen digitally or a sticker. It doesn't matter. And it says, do you know that it's cheaper to draw money from the till than from our ATM? It's counterintuitive. They're almost driving me away from their product. If you know what I'm saying. And that's the point where brands start playing a responsible role for society for the long game. You know what I mean? Now, obviously, they want you to stick your card in and, and pay fees. That's, the, that's, the, that's that part of their business. Um, but they understand the bigger play. So, you know, Russia, I'm a big proponent of it, but for the right reasons. What I, as, a, as a marketing guy, what I hate is people sitting in a room with creative guys saying, hey, listen, let's luck. Like, Get a purpose statement because it's a cool thing to do. That's just bullshit. You know what I mean? Don't, don't do that exercise. Do the exercise because you really want to move your company forward for its customers and ultimately for South Africa or, or for that matter, whichever territory you're playing in. So, Doug, you do some lecturing. What is What are empirical studies showing around marketing principles, how quickly our world is changing, and where marketing principles are going to. So since you did your undergraduate and your doctorate, yeah. and of course got your corporate and commercial experience, with, yeah. with the changes you're seeing now in the business work, the business models, where do you see marketing principles going to? I think there are a few fundamentals that have stayed the same and probably will stay the same. And I think it's important for marketers to realize that they're actually trying to find a meet or create a need of a customer. So create a customer and keep a customer. That's the principle, the general principle of marketing. And it's not done for uh, themselves, the agency or anything else. So I think that's a general fundamental principle that has stayed in place. Some stuff that's come in, and, and again, a lot of the stuff is not new and it shouldn't be a surprise and people shouldn't say, geez, that's like a 2021 idea. That's just crazy, is understanding your market, you know, so a lot of people, a lot of places I work with now, 
don't just gather data for the sake of it, but gather data to get those insights and to work out those niches. So it's a question of, you know, South Africa is just one territory. It's a complex country. You know, lots of different people, the languages, nuances. Um, uh, I do some work with a, with a great guy, Napster, and, and, and what he does is a lot of the time through, through my career, if you have an advert, we would write it in English and then you translate it into, into different languages. That's typically how it would work. Okay? But what he was saying is, and he runs a very small, bespoke African, proudly African, when I say African, black African, understands it and by, by his own admission, he's a proud black South African. He says, I don't, I may write in English if it's for an English ad, but I actually may not. He says, but I don't, I'm not an expert in every language in South Africa. So what he often does, and they did a great piece of work for Telcom a few years ago uh, with wonderful results, is he got a whole lot of people in and, and gave them just a big idea and said, think in your language. So you've got to conceptualize and understand so that the narrative's not exactly the same. It's the same principle. But it's said differently with its nuances, its slang, it's, you know, all of that. And so, and that's the rich tapestry. So I think that's part of, of marketing is if you're going to do really good stuff, sometimes it's dangerous being too vanilla. Uh, that could be great for a big brand piece. That's a, that's a catch all. But once it starts dropping down into actions, you sometimes need to get granular. The other big move of, of and, and again, it's been coming, it's not, a, not an absolutely new thing, but certainly COVID has accelerated is online, you know, is e-commerce, people buying. For many, many, many people, it's the first time they've perhaps bought off an app. You know, I look at some of the, and again, I don't want to pick our favorites. I'm just giving you what, what is in the public domain. The Checker 6060 app has just shaken up the market, you know, getting a whole lot of new customers. Uh, the, the, the shopping card out of Checkers has done really well and continues to do well for them. You know, you look at curbside pickup, you look at click and collect, from Woolworths, you look at macro, the, um, the the lockers you go around the country, out of necessity, people were scared, people were in lockdown. I think a lot of those people will not go back to the old behavior. In other words, you know, they will still continue shopping online and they'll, they'll continue with that behavior. So e-commerce and that whole digital integration now, if you're a modern marketer and you start saying, well, we must do something digitally, then, you, then you're completely out of the game already. Then you're actually the wrong person for the job because digital is so integrated in everything you do. It's, it's just part of your being. So, so that's an aspect as well. The other thing I think is, is, and again, not everybody, but a lot of people have you know, worked from home and consumed far more data than they've ever done before. So you look at you know, data networks, I look at rain, and I know that they're not all over South Africa, but certainly in the areas that, that come into as a true challenger, much like the Capitec model in banking, had a bit of a go at, at, at the big networks, Vodacom and MTN. So that's an interesting example out of necessity because people are using far more data than they've ever done. I mean, we're sitting on a data call right now using Zoom as a platform that a year ago, I, I wouldn't have known how to do it, and, and you do now. Um, the other aspect, and again, not for every South African, but a lot of South Africans, is the rise of, of on-demand consumption of media. So in other words, television, you know, it's not linear. It's not like it used to be um, a few years back, we sit down at eight o'clock or seven o'clock and watch something. Today, you know, it's a lot of it is streamed, not everybody, and I'm not just talking Netflix and Showmax, I'm talking other platforms as well. The challenge that that um, throws up is Stu Kinico has just gone into business rescue now. And and again, you know, that I think was coming for a while, the big movie house of, of the 80s and the 90s. Perhaps a, a, a different model is there. So those are those are just some of the things. And I think just the last point I want to make, and I mean, there are lots we can talk about. One of the other big points in, in terms of marketing is a, a better, I think, understanding of the integration between external marketing for the public and internal marketing for your own staff who love the brand. You know, you've got to get your staff to have uh, a head and heart type approach. You know, a lot of people can understand marketing, but traditionally, sometimes it was like, those guys there, the nuclear agency, make TV ads. That's that's not good enough anymore. You need an integration. And a lot of good companies these days in, in speaking with them and working with them have got a fundamental understanding. Certainly two divisions have come together, head of human resources or talent uh, and head of marketing, saying, listen, let's make sure that everybody, even though you don't have a job type of marketing, whether you're the forklift driver, have an understanding of what are we trying to do 
where the, you're the security guy that, and most obviously customer service, people on the front end who deliver the product. So those are some of the, some of the big ticket items that have come out. Some of them are not absolutely new. And I think the biggest acceleration has been in the field of digital and e-commerce. Wow, Doug, that's, that's a lot to digest for people within marketing, the consumer who's also experiencing this rapid change at the moment. And, uh, you know, I'm also thinking about those sitting on boards, um, providing oversight and guidance on how marketing, branding and culture kind of speak to each other and, and the link between organizational culture and what your brand is recognized for is a pretty interesting one. So let's then turn our attention back to leadership. And Doug, when I speak to you, I can't miss the opportunity to speak about the status of national sports in South Africa and the lessons in leadership uh, that we could perhaps take from there. I ask this because sports has always been that magic factor that unites South Africa you know, in our deepest crisis. And just before lockdown, I had the pleasure of being in Cape Town to see Sia Kholisi uh, drive through the streets of Cape Town with the Rugby World Cup. And that made us believe again um, in the power of Stronger Together. It, of course, was a proud moment to see Sia Kholisi who comes from PE. But if, the, if sport is that uniting force and we are not seeing fantastic examples in sport leadership at the moment, what role can leadership in sports playing in inspiring hope um, around nation building? Uh, yeah, Roshni, great question. And, and, and I mean, I'm 100% behind it. I believe that, you know, if you look back at, at iconic moments, uh, certainly in the world, and, and if you just look at South Africa, you look at 95 World Cup, 96 African Cup of Nations, you know, you look at uh, us hosting great events, the 2010 Soccer World Cup and so on and so on. And our rugby wins and, and we can go on. We're not going to go through each item, but we understand that that power when you see Jazar Tungani, I think it was in the 1986 Atlanta Games, winning the, the, the um, marathon, Lana May in 1992, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's absolutely wonderful. I think, though, in my experience, having worked with many sporting codes, many sporting people, and many, many administrators through the year, now, of course, there are exceptions. But as a general rule, I think our sporting people have been better than the administrators. I think there's a gap. I think the administrators, in my opinion, have not been as professional, have, have been more amateurish in, in their approach, and have been more fans of the game than proper business people, you know, you, you, and if I look again, if I look at some of the American examples, you know, if you go into some of those franchises, that person running the Mets, the Nets, the Knicks, the Clippers, they could have tomorrow go work at Citibank. So that's the same caliber, you know what I mean? It's not like the guy is necessarily a fan of ice hockey or basketball, as an example. Um, and I think we've got somewhere to go. As a recent example, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I think you may have seen MBM Holdings out of America buying 51% of the Sharks rugby franchise. Now, that's a massive shakeup. You know, they, they, they spent a lot of time doing diligence with the Stormers in Western Province, and that deal fell through for whatever reason. I, I'm not party to, to that. But either way, they've gone and done a deal there. Now, what is quite interesting is that part of that deal is they've got a shareholding with Rock Nation, Jay-Z, the, the, the artist, the singer, and they signed up Sia as an ambassador. Okay, I think Cheslin Colby and Sia are the only two South Africans on Rock Nation's books. In talking with Ed Pizzi, the CEO of the Sharks, and I know Ed Wall from our dealings with the Sharks, who, who were the headline sponsor for many years when, when I was uh, there, um, they want to take their brand to the next level. And it's not just on field. So you've got rugby, 15 guys, the cricket, you've got 11 guys playing, and you try to get the other guys out and you try to win the game. That's pretty easy. You know, there's only three things that can happen. There's a win, a lose, and a draw. But off the field, there's a lot of stuff that can happen. You know, I look at empty, not because it's COVID. That's, I know the stands are empty because of COVID. I look at, before that, I look at the state of domestic cricket. I want to see this new system coming in back to the old method. I, I don't know. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I just want to see it. I mean, Cricket South Africa have had their own shambles, and, and, and we don't have to discuss that. It's all in the press. Rugby South Africa, I mean, Yuri Ru that was found guilty uh, of, 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 of an issue with Stellenbosch University. So there's, there's, there's an issue there. I don't know. I'm not taking sides. I'm not a lawyer. Just telling you what I'm reading on, on the net. Soccer for now looks okay, but, uh, you know, we, 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 they've also had their ups and downs. 
Ses cock. I don't know. South African athletics? No, I'm not sure. You know, so a lot of those bodies, unfortunately, I don't think they're at the top of their game. Excuse the pun. Whereas the athlete, you know, the person throwing the javelin, hitting the tennis ball, they just want to do their craft, swim, whatever. And, and that's a shame. So I'd like to see leadership playing a role. Now, let me give you, again, by way of a practical example, a few years back, I was uh, again in America and I went as part of my Ken Blanchard stuff that I do. Uh, I went to a baseball team in, in San Diego called the San Diego Padres. And uh, I spent a half a day there with, with some of their staff. And they clearly made the point to me. They said, first things first, what business are we in? So I said, it's obvious you're in the business of baseball. They said, no, we're actually not in the business of baseball. We play in a tournament called the Major Leagues. Okay. We're in the business of making major league memories. So everybody who comes into the ballpark must walk away with a major league memory, whether it's their first game they've watched as a little kid, their 100th game, their anniversary. And, and the lady Stacey who took me around said, in your case, it's not even season. They're not even playing baseball. So how are we going to leave you when you go back to South Africa with a major league memory? Now, let me tell you, I've, I've retold this story so many times before. So we did the whole tour and she showed me the stuff and we went through everything. Two aspects, on-field, off-field. She says, on-field, they're baseball players. Some of them throw, they pitchers, and some of them hit, and some of them catch it. That's, that's what they do. If they don't do their jobs right, the coaches, get rid of them. They sell them, they buy players. I don't ever talk to the players. I don't voice a comment. I don't tell the guy she throws. I don't know that stuff. By the same token, the players and the coaches don't get involved in what I get involved in, off field. So when you walk around my ballpark, and she took me for a tour, she says the audio doesn't crackle. The hot dogs are hot and the cold drinks are cold because that's how it's supposed to be. She says, go to other ballparks. You don't want a lukewarm hot dog. She says, our bathrooms don't smell horrible. We, they, 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 we know that every touch point, our people tuck their shirts in. You show you a practical example. Here's the, here's the handbook of the Padres. It's 136 pages. There it is. Yeah, 130. This is a baseball team. Some companies don't have books like this. This is a behavior. This is how you behave when you work for the Padres in, in San Diego. There it is. 136 pages. So, and, and, and anyway, now my story is so then she said to me at the end of the day, Doug, it's been wonderful having you here. Would you like a photograph? On the field. I said, I'd love a photograph, take it home and the rest. So we walked down and we're standing and she says, why don't you stand at home plate? You know, it's the most special place in the field. And I say, fantastic. So I'm standing at home plate and I'm about to have my photograph taken. And a guy about 20 meters away on a little, those little mini tractors that you sit on cutting the grass, stops the tractor, comes jogging over and takes out a napkin and he wipes the plate below me. So I say, to, I look down and I say to him, what are you doing? And he looks up and he says to me, it'll make for a better photograph, sir. And he jogs away. And she says to him, thanks for making a major league memory. Now, that's their value set. Now, it was almost, I almost didn't believe it. I almost thought it was put on. I thought it was too syrupy. I thought it was too good. You know what I mean? But she, and, and I, I said to her, was it, she says, he didn't know. He, how do, we're not that good that we can, you know, we can choreograph it on the mic saying, you know. She says, Doug, it's in us. It's, it's in our being. That's values in action. We live our values. Our main purpose here is not to win baseball games. That's a derivative of our purpose. Our purpose is to leave everybody out of the place called Pico Park, which is the ground sponsor, with a major league memory. And, and watching a long way around, I'm not sure we, we're there yet as South Africans. I think the franchises that are pretty good. Uh, I think the Sharks are, are pretty good at that. They do well. And we've got great sponsors. You know, if you look at some of the work that KFC is doing with cricket, you look back years ago, and I know you're a cricket fan, Baker's Mini Cricket, great initiatives. They're wonderful. You look at the youth weeks that come through. So a lot of that stuff is good. You know, Coca-Cola, Rugby Week, there, there are a lot of good things happening, but you can do more. Absolutely. And I've always been a big proponent of it in, in my marketing when I ran, you know, fairly big, brands is to do four things, you know, brand, sponsorship, which is the category we're talking about, product, and then retail. And I love sponsorship because of that point we made, because of that yes, because of the togetherness, because of the sharing the jersey and stronger together. So yeah, hopefully, you know, my wish for South Africa is that we can get better at sporting administration. 
uh, and, uh, and, you know, take it to the next level. And I mean, again, you know, a lot of the guys I refer to, I actually know them. So I'm not saying they're good or bad people. I've, I've got on with most of them, but I'm just looking at it from a professional point of view. I think, you know, um, I, I'm not sure we would win the World Cup of admin as we would have, you know, in, in many other cases, won the World Cup of sport. Yeah, Doug, thanks. It's clear that you're advocating that we need to clearly articulate what is the end game we're in as a team on and off the field. And secondly, you know, what shines out or stands out is that a person who's technically competent is not necessarily the best leader. And that's perhaps something that one can consider when looking at leadership development programs. So Future Thrive is a series that influences the integration of the sustainable development goals in business strategies. There are 17 sustainable development goals that can be summarized in three areas, and those are human rights and basic needs, environmental stewardship, fair and responsible business practices. And Doug today has quite kindly shared with us some examples of where branding, marketing, and commercial rights management because of the work company values and culture can translate into really impactful um, corporate social investment strategies. Doug, as we go into a new 2021 and we look forward to um, Q2, 3 and 4 now, any last point around positive leadership, abundance and kindness? I just think, you know, I mean, my point is you can be a nice person and get ahead. I, I fundamentally believe that. And what I say is that doesn't take away from doing the job. And I'm not saying be nice for the sake of it. The power of the smile, when you smile, someone will smile back at you. That's just the way it works. So why don't you do more of it? Be kind, be civil, be decent. And again, I think the world needs it now more than ever before. You know, people need leadership. And when I say strong leadership, sometimes... You can replace it with vulnerable leadership as long as your people buy in the authenticity of the leader and that your ultimate goal is the betterment, in other words, the abundance. And again, back to Professor Cameron, who uses the term the heliotropic effect, plant light seeking. So a plant would seek light, not dark, you know, up versus down. So positive behavior versus negative. So be positively deviant in your leadership behavior is probably a good way to leave it. Doug, it's always energizing to speak to you. So thank you very much for giving us your time and also sharing with us some really tangible case studies to contextualize uh, marketing and principle of leadership related to that. Listeners, thank you very much for joining us today, whether you're listening live or the recorded version. Um, we really appreciate your time. And of course, you supporting the SMEs will help to sustain their businesses and of course, see them grow into the future. Please like or share this video, leave a comment below, and also subscribe to the Strat Connect channel to keep posted on our future Future Thrive series. Thank you to Theo from IT Tech for helping us with the IT as always. If you are requiring any IT assistance, please drop us an email and we'll connect you directly to Theo. Thank you also to Flowers by Lee for the beautiful arrangement behind me and for bringing nature into our digital conversations. Please watch our social media pages to stay updated for the March webinar series. And remember that as a society, we are always stronger together. So lift others as you rise and sustainably we shall thrive. See you the next time. Bye-bye.